What's going on guys, my name is Matt and today we're going to be taking a look at an 8 core Ryzen 7000 based mini gaming PC that starts at under $400, that can play tons of different games at 60 plus FPS, and is literally small enough to fit inside of my pocket. This is the Mini Forms UM773 Lite, and in today's video, I'm going to be showing you the unboxing experience, all the specs and features, how it performs in gaming, and finally answer the question of whether or not you should consider picking one of these up. So, let's dive right in. Opening up the box, we're greeted by the device itself, wrapped in a bag and encased in some nice closed cell foam. Under that foam, we find the AC to DC power adapter, ATX power cable, an HDMI cable, which is nice to see included, a desktop stand, and some various other accessories that we'll be discussing throughout this video. In terms of basic specs, this UM773 Lite is equipped with an 8-core, 16-thread Ryzen 7 7735HS. This is a mobile CPU that can turbo up to 4.75GHz and features the surprisingly powerful integrated 680M graphics. You can get this bare bones without RAM or an SSD for only $380 or for about $100 more, you can get the model featured in this video with 16GB of DDR5 memory and a 512GB NVMe SSD. You will save about 40 bucks buying the bare bones version and installing your own memory and SSD, but that does mean you'll have to install your own copy of Windows. Now before we dive any deeper, I want to take a minute to talk about the sponsor of today's video, Kingwin.net. Kingwin.net offers a bunch of different software keys at some very good prices, and what's even better is by using my code MATT, it's going to get you 20% off of all software keys. This means you can get stuff like Windows 10 Pro for around $20 and Windows 11 Pro for around $25 when you use that code. Beyond Windows keys, Kingwin also offers great deals on stuff like Microsoft Office and some very new and popular games like Hogwarts Legacy and The Last of Us. Purchasing on Kingwin is super simple as you can sign in using an existing account from the likes of Google or Facebook, and you can check out using secure payment options like PayPal. After picking the product you want and checking out, you'll receive your key moments later. To check out all these great deals and support the channel, make sure to head to the link in the description and use the code MATT for 20% off of all software keys. Thanks again to Kingwin for sponsoring this video, and now let's get back to your regularly scheduled content. Getting back to the UM773, let's start by taking a quick look at the outside. On the front we find two USB Type-C connections, the one on the right is 3.2 Gen 2 with 10 gigabit speeds, but the one on the left is actually using USB 4 which is 40 gigabit max speeds and means you can hook up something like an external GPU or even output video directly from this port at up to 8K 60fps which is kinda crazy. There's also a power button and a clear CMOS button which I don't expect many people to really need, but it's nice to have. On the back we find the 19 volt power input, 2.5 gigabit LAN which is great to see, 4 USB type A ports, 2 of which are USB 2 and the other are USB 3. There's also a Kensington lock, some venting, and dual HDMI ports that support up to 4K 60fps, meaning you could theoretically power a triple monitor setup on this guy, utilizing the 2 HDMI ports and the 1 USB 4 port at the front. The two sides just have some more venting, the top has a textured design with the Minis Forum logo, and the bottom features some rubberized feet and two mounting holes that I'll talk about more in a second. In terms of the actual physical size, this guy is pretty small with a 5 inch by 5 inch footprint and a height of 2 inches, which in millimeters is about 125 by 125 by 50. After taking a look at the exterior, I decided to plug it into my test setup to power it on and get it configured. Now there are three ways to physically set up this device. One is just flat on the table like this. Two is on its side in the included stand to take up less desk space, and three is you can vase mount it to the back of a monitor like this with the included bracket, basically turning this PC and a monitor into a pretty powerful pseudo all-in-one PC. Once powered on, the models with SSDs and RAM pre-installed will load you directly into the Windows 11 setup screen where I just went through the prompts and in about 5 or 10 minutes was in Windows 11. The CPU slash graphics drivers were pre-installed and up to date, meaning all I had to do was download some games to test out. 
Now before I show you the gaming benchmarks, I want to crack this guy open to give us a better look at all of the internals. To get inside, you first have to flip it over, and unfortunately there are no exposed screws, meaning yes, you have to pull up the adhesive rubber feet to access the four screws. Mini's forum does include replacements for the large rubber feet, but I think it would be much better to just have the screws exposed so you can easily open and close the device whenever you want. With the four screws out, I was able to pry up on this panel to remove it. Doing this gives us a much better look at some of the internals. On one side, there's the two 8GB sticks of DDR5 memory, and on the other side is the SSD under a pretty chunky heatsink. I wanted to try and pull the board fully out, so I removed the four screws around the edges. The board wasn't wanting to come out, so I thought there might be some more screws to remove, so I popped out the RAM and removed the SSD heatsink, which did reveal four more screws that I ended up removing, but I figured out later I didn't actually need to remove these. Then I kind of flexed the outer shell to eventually get the board to come out. It was still tethered to the case so I removed the SSD which gave me access to the Wi-Fi card and allowed me to disconnect the antennas and fully free the board. This was honestly pretty cool for me to see and hold and kind of just left me amazed at what kind of computing power is possible in such a small form factor. On the other side of the board is just the heatsink which is mounted with those four screws I removed earlier, meaning I could just remove the fan cable then wiggle the heatsink and pop it off. Also, just a note, all tests were done on this machine before opening it up, just to make sure I was getting the true out-of-box experience and performance. Normally at this point, I would remove all the thermal paste to get a better look at the heatsink and CPU die itself, but I didn't do that because this system is actually using liquid metal to cool the CPU, which is pretty neat to see. And while it's not within the scope of this video, I do wonder how much of a performance difference this actually makes versus just regular thermal paste. The cooler we can see is using two big heat pipes attached to two separate heat sinks, and we can see the single laptop style blower fan. Looking at the CPU die itself, it's kind of incredible how small it is taking into account the fact it has a powerful 8 core Ryzen CPU and an integrated GPU that outperforms a budget desktop GPU like the 1050 in a lot of instances. So after quickly looking at this, I reinstalled the heatsink and those four screws from before. Then I took a look at the RAM, which is a 2x8GB kit of Crucial DDR5 at 4800MHz CL40. This is super basic DDR5, and as far as I know, this is the fastest supported memory on this device. Reinstalling this is super simple, it just uses the standard laptop RAM mounting clips. I then reinstalled the antennas and cover on the MediaTek Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth card, then reinstalled the SSD, which is a 512GB Kingston OEM Gen 4 drive. Then I could grab the, again, very chonky SSD heatsink, which I set in place and reinstalled with the two screws. Then I was able to push the board back into place. Now, this system does have both M.2 slots taken up with the NVMe drive and Wi-Fi card, but you can actually attach a 2.5 inch SATA SSD to the bottom panel and connect it with the included SATA power and data combo cable. This is a really good option for adding a lot of flash storage on the cheap. Then, once I was done checking out the SATA drive mount and connection system, I closed up the panel, reinstalled the screws, and reapplied the original feet that did seem to re-adhere decently well. So now that you have an understanding of what this device is and what's under the hood, it's now time to talk about what it's like to use it and how well it can game. In normal Windows slash productivity use, it works great, which is to be expected from an 8-core Ryzen 7 system with 16 gigs of RAM and an NVMe SSD. In terms of gaming, I decided to test 8 different games ranging from easy esports titles to modern AAA titles, so let's start with the easy ones and work our way up. Hopping into Valorant at 1080p low settings, this system was able to output an impressive 214 FPS average with 1% 1 lows of 126. This was a very smooth and enjoyable experience that should be enough performance for competitive play. There weren't any major frame drops and overall Valorant on this machine works really well. Next I load up Minecraft at 1080p 
with fast graphics and both 12 chunk render and simulation distance. I just hopped into a creative world, equipped an elytra and some rockets, and flew around to see what kind of performance I would get. The FPS was kind of all over the place, but ended up resulting in a 217 FPS average with not great 1% lows of 32. You could probably lock the frame rate to get more stable performance, but overall, there weren't any major lag spikes or anything, and I'd be perfectly fine playing Minecraft at these settings with this performance. In Rainbow Six, I tested at 1080p with the medium preset utilizing the built-in benchmark. Doing this resulted in a respectable 143 FPS average with 1% lows of 101. What's interesting is switching to Vulcan actually reduces performance by about 40 FPS on average, so if you're playing Rainbow Six on this machine, I would definitely recommend not running Vulcan, which you get the option to when you open it through Steam. Overall, 143 FPS average is quite solid in my opinion, and this should be enough performance for casual play. Next up is Fortnite, which I tested at 1080p in performance mode and cranked the view distance to epic and the textures to high. Doing this resulted in a decent 110 FPS average with 1% lows of 24. There definitely was some stuttering, but I get stutters in Fortnite on even high-end machines, so that was definitely to be expected. You could play around with the settings and lock the frame rate, but I think this performance is still pretty decent as is. Next up is Overwatch 2, which I tested at 1080p with the medium preset. Hopping into a no limits game, I was seeing an average of 76 FPS and 1% lows of 43. This was a very smooth and enjoyable experience in my opinion, and while I don't think this is going to be enough performance for a lot of competitive DPS players, it's more than enough for some casual fun matches. Rust is the next game we're going to talk about, and I have no idea what the optimal settings are. I think I'd consider this medium low and the resolution was 1080p. I went onto a few random servers and just ran around. Overall, I got an average of 56 FPS with 1% lows of 31. Getting close to and inside of complex structures definitely dipped the FPS a bit, and I didn't experience any firefights or anything, but I think this should be good enough performance for casual play, especially if you play around with the settings more, and if there are certain settings you recommend me changing for future tests, let me know in the comments below. So with the easier to run games out of the way, let's talk about the AAA titles. I wanted to run Cyberpunk, which this should be able to handle at 720p, but unfortunately for one reason or another the game just wouldn't open. I have seen other people run this game on the same APU, so I think this is just a problem on my end. For Borderlands 3, a AAA game that's a few years old at this point, I tested it at 1080p low settings using the built-in benchmark. Doing this resulted in a 55 FPS average with 1% lows of 40. In-game at the same resolution and settings, I did my standard boss fight and saw an average of 60 FPS with 1% lows of 23, which was still very solid and playable in my opinion. In Far Cry 6, I again tested at 1080p low using the built-in benchmark. This resulted in a 45 FPS average with 1% lows of 35. This is definitely on the edge of playable, but if you're wanting to play modern AAA titles, a full-size desktop or console might be the better option here. Now, I actually ran Far Cry 6 and Borderlands 3 first and used those as control results to see if adjusting anything in BIOS would change performance. In the BIOS, I played around with the CPU TDP and amount of allocated video memory. Changing the TDP from auto to 55 watts, which is the max, I didn't notice any major changes in performance, but did notice higher temps, so I just left it at auto. I also played around with the video memory and ended up landing on 3GB over the default 2GB. You can crank this up. But remember, for every gigabyte you allocate for the GPU, you're taking a gigabyte away from the CPU as they are sharing that same 16 gigabytes. I also did a run of Cinebench R23, which resulted in a multi core score of 12,436 and a single core score of 1561. This means this chip has pretty similar multi core performance to a desktop 5600X. In terms of temps while gaming, the CPU ranged from the low 60s to upper 70s, while the GPU ranged from the low 70s to low 80s, which is perfectly acceptable temps. This machine is definitely audible while gaming, but is not really loud or obnoxious in my opinion. Overall, performance is pretty good given the form factor and cost of this machine. So now it's time to answer the question of who, if anyone, should consider picking this mini PC up. 
If all you want is pure gaming performance, going for a console or custom PC is going to make a lot more sense in my opinion, but if you just want a powerful productivity machine that can do some light gaming on the side while taking up very little space and using very little power, then this machine might be right for you. At about $480, I do think this is giving a decent value per dollar in overall performance, but I don't know if I'd truly designate this as a gaming PC. And this is because modern AAA titles can be difficult or impossible to run on it in some instances. With that being said, I'm interested to hear what you guys think of this little mini PC and if you'd consider picking one up. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. Oh, and as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.